Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything Beatles, any part of their past, things going on in the news, anything that we feel like talking about is covered here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts. You might know me from my other Beatles program, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my three other regular co-hosts. First of all, the writer for Beatles Examiner, we have Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also from Beatle Fan Magazine, he's been writing for them since the very beginning, from uh, 1978, I think the year was, and that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also one of the writers for Beatle Fan, but he's also a freelance writer and a musicologist, that being Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. On the program this time, we're going to be talking about a number of things and um, some things happening in the news. We're going to be commenting about uh, a few recordings of the Beatles, live recordings that just got some airplay on the radio. We're going to be discussing in just a few moments. But before we do that, we want to make mention of a couple of very dear people to us in the Beatle community and uh, talk about in the case of Rick Lover, who was a terrific guest with us here uh, recently on the show. He's the guy who started the Fans on the Run Club and got to go on stage with Paul McCartney and give him a button for the, for the club. He's seen Paul in concert more than anybody else we know, and he has a very serious health condition. And uh, Al, would you like to comment about that? Yeah, uh, a few of us had been um, advised by Rick a few weeks back that he was um, uh, undergoing chemo and radiation treatment for uh, for cancer, um, which has appeared and gone away and reappeared again. And so uh, uh, he finally uh, finally made it made it public apparently on Facebook today. Uh, um, uh, Steve advised us of that just a little while ago. And obviously, we want to send our our best wishes uh, to Rick, who is a you know a friend uh, friend of us all, and um, and obviously part of the uh, part of the Beatle fan family for uh, uh, almost uh, almost as long as I have, and right. um, and uh, so we you know want to extend our uh, our best wishes and our and our prayers to Rick. Right, we're all thinking of you, Rick. Absolutely. And someone else that you're more familiar with, Steve. I'm actually, um, I'm not really familiar with this other uh, Beatle fan that you well, were mentioning. It's, before. it's Pat Niemi Kubaki, and I hope that's the way she pronounces her name. I'm reading it off, off my screen. I have had some contact with her in the past, and she's a big Beatle fan. I've seen, I've seen some of her posts, and she's a huge Beatle fan. And she's um, apparently her, her husband posted this morning that she's. Uh, having some real serious health problems and um and she deserves uh our thoughts and prayers too so um i was sending them out to for both uh, rick and pat okay so get better, anybody will... yes. yes get better both of, both of you okay we're going to start with uh, a news item that steve just wrote about today and we're taping this on uh august the 17th about um an appearance on chris carter's show on KLOS uh, the previous day on Sunday, and Vince Calandra was a guest on the show. And this was someone that played a part in uh, Beatle history because he was there during the rehearsals for the Ed Sullivan show. And a lot of people know that he kind of subbed at the time for George. Uh, George was, he had a sore throat at the time, was it? Uh, strep throat. And also Neil Aspinall subbed for George momentarily. Right. But for a while there, Vince was there and uh, they put a Beatle wig on him. <laughs> and uh, I think many of us have seen the photo of that. But um, on Chris Carter's show, they talked about this footage that exists from the rehearsals. So you can tell us more about that, Steve. Well, I'd interviewed Vince a few years ago. And yeah, the big, the big thing with Vince is that he, there's a picture of him that of uh, him standing in for George with a Beatle wig on. And he even talked about that yesterday. He talked about how that happened. He said, uh, 
uh, there's a there's also a picture I'm sure everybody's seen or a lot of people have seen of Ed Sullivan with the wig on, and Sullivan mm-hmm. said. Uh, I guess Sullivan got a lot of laughs and he said, uh, let's put this on Vince and because I guess Vince at that point was was with them and uh, and they did and they took a picture. Well, Vince revealed yesterday and apparently had not revealed it before that somebody took some home movies of that particular moment of uh, of Vince standing in with the Beatles and Vince now has the footage. Uh, apparently, it costs quite a bit, uh, $100,000, to get hold of this footage. And Vince has pictures that he brought with him yesterday to the show uh, that uh, show both black and white and color. And, and you know that if you saw the original show, the show was in black and white. And so the fact that there are there is actually color pictures of that day is pretty pretty interesting and anyway so he brought those pictures uh he brought that uh with him yesterday and i I don't know if they showed obviously you couldn't i couldn't see on the radio uh (laughs) whether they actually showed the footage but they did show the pics they did pass the pictures around uh and so uh people did get to see that and there actually is a post on facebook that i linked to in my story of uh of the pictures so that you can see the pictures and they are indeed in black and white and in color but it's really uh i mean it's just uh you know pictures of them rehearsing unfortunately apparently there's no sound since movie cameras in those days were all silent anyway but uh we do have some unseen images of the beatles which seem to get a lot of uh, interest no matter how unseen they are what circumstances they're under anytime you hear unseen images of the Beatles, uh, especially in auctions. People go go wild, and apparently, you know, and I'm sure this is really, uh, you know, I mean, this is kind of interesting because of the historical aspect of where they were at the time. But anyway, we're talking about February seventh, sixty four, right? That would have been that right. rehearsal, right? Uh, the eighth, the eighth. Okay. Yeah. The eighth? Oh, okay. Oh, right, right. Saturday. You know, I, I thought there was something interesting in Vince Calandra's remarks um, where he talked about how, you know, they thought it was just going to be a rock band, but they they knew it was going to be a bit more because they'd been tracking the Beatles for some time. Mm-hmm. And he talked about how we had our people over there uh, seeing what was going on with the Beatles as early as, you know, July and August 63. You know, the very, very familiar story, which I, I think um, Bruce Spicer has to some degree debunked in, mm-hmm. in his books, um, but but you still hear the story all the time about how Ed Sullivan first heard of the Beatles when he arrived at London Air, at, at, at uh, Heathrow, I guess, in November 1963, when they were coming back from uh, Sweden. Sweden. So, right. um, you know, and everyone has been saying, oh, you know, I don't know, Ed, that doesn't sound that like and Bruce got to the bottom of it. But now here you have Vince Calandra just saying, you know, out of nowhere, oh, yeah, we were, we were tracking them in July and August 63, which means that Ed's whole story was really just kind of fabricated in a way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think that the, I think it just sort of adds extra weight to, you know, to, to the research that Bruce has done. You yes. Know, mm-hmm. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it seems like everybody has <clears throat> has a story of of one kind of an, uh, or another. Over the weekend, uh, Louise Harrison at the fest uh, at the at the fest in Chicago uh, on stage told Tom Frangione that uh, that she had um, that she had had a, a DJ in Benton, Illinois, uh, play from me to you. And which meant that uh, that 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 DJ was uh, was playing it for the first time in America, which is absolutely untrue because an hour and a half earlier, Dick Biondi had been on stage, uh, and Bruce Spicer had played the audio clip, which I believe you can find on YouTube, of of him playing "Please Please Me" in February mm-hmm. of '63. So, you know, it's like everybody has a different story and a yeah. different version of the history. And it's it's sometimes the, you know, the truth gets kind of mixed up. 
Yeah. Well, and Louise wouldn't necessarily have been aware of what Dick Biondi was doing. You know, they were not in the same place. And right. So. But you would think that 50 years later, she would realize that, you know, that that wasn't the first time that. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. That, that record had been played in America. And it makes yeah. perfect sense that since those singles came out in 63 in America and Please Please Me preceded yes. for me to you, and right. you know that all the singles got some airplay somewhere mm-hmm. in little right. pockets here and there, right. that somebody had to take a chance on Please Please Me. Exactly. So exactly. I'm not sure if Dick Biondi was the first one. He probably was. He was certainly the, one of the very uh, first. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. He's 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 the first in which there is audio documentation. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as I said, when um, when Mark Lapidos was a guest on our show, the very the very fact that VJ Records was in Chicago. Yes. Had a lot to do. And, and WLS was the I guess the biggest top 40 station at mm-hmm. the time in yes. Chicago. Mm-hmm. So uh, it makes natural sense that they would have a relationship together. So, sure. um, yeah, I would I would believe that that would be either the first or one of the first mm-hmm. to play. Absolutely. Please, please. me. Right. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, another big story is concerning two of the cuts from the Beatles' 1965 Shea concert, which were played the stereo versions of the songs on Chris Carter's show. So, what exactly is the story behind these stereo versions and how how uh, that appeared now? How that has surfaced? Well, we had you know we had Dave. Swenson uh, on uh, a couple of weeks ago and in his book he actually talks a lot about uh, you know how the the uh, concert was recorded and uh, and and he has quotes in there from Ron Fermanac who when he was working at Apple in the early 90s uh, they put together a Shea documentary and he completely remixed the soundtrack um, using Basically, the tapes that had come down, you know, through the through the uh, people who had recorded it. Bob Fine had produced the recordings, and uh, and now those recordings have been have been bootlegged, uh, and they're in, you know, they're they're very listenable, but parts of them are very rough. And Ron was able to make some seriously good stereo mixes. I say seriously good, you know, based on what he said, and you know, I kind of believe him. Um, and uh, so. These have never come out because the Shea documentary has never come out. One of the many things sitting on Apple's shelves um, that they bothered to put together and then not release. And um, so Steve, I think, heard the show, Chris Carter's uh, Beale Breakfast, where uh, Dave Morell and uh, Dave Morell by himself or was Fermanac with him? No, it Steve. was just Morell. It was Morell and, uh, and um, uh, Calandra. Uh, Fermanac was not there. So why don't you take it from there, Steve? Well, uh, they played two songs, and I believe it was... Uh, I didn't hear the whole show, unfortunately. Um, I, ha- I have it, and I haven't listened to it completely, but they did play I'm Down. They played Dizzy Miss Lizzy, because that I heard, uh, and I believe they also played I'm Down. Let me point out, though, that having... I mean, we've all... Uh, a lot of us, I assume, have heard that bootleg of the stereo tracks from mm-hmm. Shea that came out last year. And I listened to that um, over the weekend, and to I heard I did hear the stereo tracks, um, some of the stereo tracks before the show, and the quality on the stuff that was played on the show was not the same, and in fact was much better than the uh, than the bootleg. The bootleg stuff sounded and 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 I'll, i would like to hear your opinions guys the bootleg stuff sounded really tinny in spots some of those tracks not all the tracks not all the shade tracks on that bootleg were in stereo right um, that's true. right so but i mean the stereo tracks uh, uh, i remember when i first heard it i was kind of a little disappointed partially because the whole thing wasn't in stereo but also because the stereo did not sound really good it didn't sound great i mean it it didn't it wasn't a straight if that was supposed to be a straight transfer of those tracks it did a hell of a lousy job the stuff i heard before the show was much much better much better I, you know i think that's important that the stuff that carter played was much better than has been out there before alan you agree 
Have you did you hear the? You didn't. Hear um, I so. did. I didn't hear them yet. Um, but yeah, I, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know what? The thing that came out a, a couple of years ago was, uh, I think, Fermanac has basically said himself that it, it basically was his edit of the Shea film that he, he did in 1991, but that the soundtrack wasn't all his finished soundtrack. Um, well, and well, what, that, what what came out? Remember, there were two. Uh, sets of things that came out. There was the line recordings, right? Um, uh, and then there was the the stuff that came out last year. So there's right two on the DVD, right? So there's two different. We're talking about two different bootlegs here, um, right? And, and they sound very different from each other too, because the line recordings are the ones that are a little bit rough, and uh, mm -hmm. um, the the DVD um, sounds a lot better because I mean. It, they uh, made some effort to do some some mixing and may have used a preliminary soundtrack that Fermanac put together. I'm not sure what the story is, but um, right. you know, it was really kind of interesting. It's it's supposed to represent his 1991 uh, edit, um, and so for instance, you don't have. Um, Brian Epstein speaking during Can't Buy Me Love. You just have the track. Um, and it's, you know, as, as, as Dave had pointed out in his book and when he was here, I guess, um, they got rid of all of the extra film from Shea. So the only things that he had to work with were the film from the, from the finished product. And it looks largely like the film that we know, but he did a bit of editing and it did a bit of replacing of things here and there and, uh, and replaced the soundtrack. I'd love to hear what he actually did, um, which apparently the, the DVD bootleg doesn't have. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and, you know, you have to wonder, don't you? <laughs> here it was, the 50th anniversary of... The Beatles at Shea Stadium, uh, a gig that is, you know, beyond the Beatles world. It's a big deal because it started the whole stadium rock thing. And you would right. think that Apple, who has had this on their shelves, finished product, all done since 1991, 92, certainly before the anthology came out, would have taken this opportunity to release it, wouldn't you guys? And and on top and on top of that, as as Morel said to me. Um, when I talked to him and, and Ron last week, and also he said it on Carter's show, it was shot in 35 millimeter. The quality right. is, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And there's no, you know, and it's not, we're not talking 16 millimeter, which was done for Bangladesh, which, you know, which was done for Monterey Pop, for, you know, many other films. We're talking 35 millimeter. And we all saw the clips in the anthology and we all kind of dropped right. our, we all dropped our jaws and said, holy you know that's fantastic, and where is it? You know, and and again, we didn't get it. And I think, you know, and I think they really blew this. I think, uh, you know, they're 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 the quiet is deafening on this one, and I it's really a shame. It's really a shame that they didn't they didn't do something here. Yeah. Well, as we've talked about many times, I think the Beatles are very much against the whole 50th anniversary of everything. They don't want to hear 50th this and 50th that mm -hmm. because it reminds people of how old it is, you know, and um, you can debate this point all you want, but that's probably the way that they're thinking. And that's probably why we've been hearing about Ron Howard working on the Beatles Live Project, because if you present it as a documentary where the emphasis is not on the years or a specific show, that has a whole other, that's a whole other approach altogether. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the Beatles one and the success of the Beatles one, but part of the reason, well, maybe, I don't know, you, we can argue over this, there's no reference to years on the Beatles one. Mm -hmm. It's just they were number one hits. Right. How can you go wrong with number one hits? When something is presented that way, without the emphasis being on a year, I think that the four parties the four families at Apple probably don't want to be reminded of, you know, how long ago it was because it could be a turn off to some people. It's certainly not to us. We think this is the greatest music of all time, but that's not the way that they look at it. So, um, and you never know, you know, as far as the Beatles one is concerned here, here we have a package of something which didn't take much effort <laughs> to put uh, together. No effort. <laughs> yeah. And you just assemble all the number one hits. Of course, it was a little bit brilliant that they added the, 
the, the um, number ones in the UK mm-hmm. that weren't number one here. So you had more bang for your buck. But something that simple became the biggest selling CD of the last decade. And it, it raises the question, when the Beatles hold back their unreleased material, does it do more to hurt them? Or, as you witness the success of the Beatles one, does it even matter? <laughs> Because mm-hmm. something as simple as that, which, like I said, it takes no effort. What does it take to put the number ones on one CD? Something mm. like that explodes and has success beyond anyone's expectations. And continues you know? to sell. And continues to sell, yes. Continues to sell and continues to sell and continues to sell in every iteration in which it's released. Well, I think the the fact that the Ron Howard film is in you know, is still in production, that may be a factor in the fact that they have not released the Beatles at Shea Stadium. But I think more, more, it's just the fact that like the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl, they just don't want those two things released as official Beatles releases because, because they're simply not up to the quality, you know, musical quality of their their studio work. But it's not like we're talking about the Japan 66 concerts where they really aren't up to quality. They're in they're right. of tune and stuff like that. And they, they didn't even bother to rehearse for that tour. You know, the 65 tour, they were they were in pretty good shape. And that Shea performance, you know, with John and the organ on I'm Down and the whole thing, it's, um, I don't know, it's very exciting. I mean, the one thing I was thinking in terms of the Ron Howard thing is that, Maybe what they have in mind is that when they put out the Ron Howard on DVD, Shea will come as a second disc. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And or then even, they don't have to worry about what year it is. <laughs> I've never heard any mention from Apple or anywhere that the Beatles have any intention of releasing the Shea concert. Right. I have. You have? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, um, can you share that with us? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it was um, in the 90s. Um, I was told that they had put the whole thing together. They had it all packaged and mixed and everything as, as they wanted it to be. And they were just waiting to put it out. I, and I, one time when I interviewed Ringo, I said, You've got, you know, you're known to have the Shea thing done. You're known to have Let It Be done. Are you going to put these things out while we can still all dance? You know, and he said, yeah, yeah, they'll come out. So... You know, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have bothered bringing in someone to produce and mix and do all of that stuff if they didn't intend to. And I I had heard in the in the early to mid 90s that Shea was something that they had done that they were going to put out. Why it never turned up, I don't know. And the same with Let It Be. Uh, You know, you can't at this point, you can't really get. I don't my, my I don't have any um, spies in there anymore. Um, but it used to be that you, know, you could get some info. But nowadays they're all too scared to talk, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when you can get one of them at a press thing or a party or something like that, um, they they really just can't tell you anything because they're sort of not authorized. And if you know it gets back that they said something, that that could be it for them. And so no one wants to lose that job, obviously. And it is a different well, administration there now. Yeah. You, know, even you see, the, the, the thing is that, that it's a new administration, and you would think that it was an administration that, um, you know, would be eager to put the stuff out for a number of reasons. I mean, um, Mr. Jones, uh, who's right. running it, uh, his his background is Sony Legacy. Everything that he put out in Sony Legacy was, you know, newly mixed or or remastered versions of classic albums plus tons of outtakes and bonus tracks and demos they were beautiful packages and you have to assume that if you're going to hire a guy like that it has to be for his expertise at doing this and yet they haven't really let him do very much sure it it must be very frustrating Mm -hmm. because of course he has to get the full the 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 unanimous verdict of the four directors there's another thing too um i don't know if you saw it recently in facebook um someone posted uh i i can't it may have even been klaus uh someone posted a long excerpt from klaus foreman's book in which he talks about his last meetings with george 
Anyone yeah. read that? Mm -hmm. Well, it has George complaining um, quite a lot. You know, the, the Beatles are simply not marketing themselves right. They're not getting things out there. Now, if it were, it's kind of strange coming from George, seeing mm. as George has sat on a, a number of things, um, in, you know, that everything I've heard is is that, He's responsible for Carnival of Light not coming out because he thinks it's self-indulgent, and he edited the the version of Shout because he thought it was self-indulgent, and same with right. You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, and possibly what he thinks of as properly marketing the Beatles is completely different from what we would think of because his mm. big project was the Love uh, production sure. with Cirque du Soleil. So, um, but nevertheless, you know, he was, according to Klaus, he was very frustrated at what Apple was not putting out, that Apple was not keeping the Beatles in front of the public all the time. And uh, that's kind of interesting, I think. That doesn't sound was like it? George to me. No. It just doesn't. George was the type of person who he loved to make music for the sake of making music, not so much for the commercial success, certainly later on in his life. He didn't yeah. care about the fanfare. He didn't care about the publicity or the attention given to him. He probably wouldn't want to hear the Beatles thrown in his face all the time. Yeah. So I, that doesn't sound like George. To I me. agree. I agree. It doesn't. But I mean, it's it's Klaus reporting it and he reports it pretty extensively uh, in that in that section of his book that was quoted. So I don't know. You know, I guess take it with however many grains of salt. But, um, you know, you're right. It does. It does seem counterintuitive with everything we know of George, but especially yeah. since so much of George's own solo archive is is sitting there, not having yeah. been been issued. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, I was going to say, wasn't George the one? Uh, and Alan, you probably know this. Who was the one that complained the most about the about all the uh, ultra rare stuff coming out? Wasn't it George? I don't know. Mm. Paul I could seemed so I... actually okay with it. Um, <laughs> Paul seemed okay with it so long as it was a bootleg. He had a problem with releasing it. This is and this is pre-anthology, so mm -hmm. he obviously got over his problem. But he had a problem with releasing it um, officially. Mm. But I don't think it bothered him that it was a bootleg. And John, we know, collected Beatles bootlegs. So, right. I think if George objected, it might be that, you know, it was sort of someone else putting it out and not them having control over it. That, right. that sounds plausible to me. Right. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, logic dictates that if the Beatles went through the trouble of cleaning up Shea Stadium and cleaning up Let It Be, that they have plans of releasing it. But maybe they, they cleaned it up so that they can use it whichever way they wanted to. In a documentary or whatever they want. It didn't necessarily mean it was for a release of a complete concert or, or the TV special. And, uh, and of or, course, there were large chunks of both in the anthology. Right. Yeah, but with the, um, with the Let It Be project, I know that they brought in people who were involved with it and including Neil um, to do interviews specifically about Let It Be. And, and I don't think think it was necessarily stuff that ended up in the anthology. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, I was told that Neil actually, for the very first time and possibly last, did the interviews without a hat on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I haven't seen any footage like that anywhere. But <laughs> I personally think that Let It Be will come out because Ringo has mentioned it a few times in the last few years. Yeah. He hasn't yeah. elaborated too much, but the mere fact that he's even saying it, yeah. he's saying it will come out eventually. But the thing is, he probably can't say when, because if you've got the Beatles live project that they're working on, maybe right. that mm -hmm. takes precedence over that. So that's just how I feel about it. But getting back to my original question, do you think that holding back the material, the unreleased material, does more damage to the Beatles? Or it just doesn't matter? Because like I said, if the Beatles one could do as well as it did. And we do know that the Beatles anthology was certainly successful, the three different double CDs. And the first collection of BBC material did really well. And I the, mean, and the Love Show has certainly been successful, right? Yeah. But you know, not everything that's been released on the Beatles has been a smashing success. No. I mean, uh, Let It Be Naked was not a big success. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Yellow Submarine song track didn't do that well. Mm -hmm. It's not like everything that comes out on the Beatles is automatically going to be a number one record, a number one album. 
But still, by and large, the biggest success has been the Beatles won. Yep. So does it really matter whether all the stuff that we know that exists and a lot of stuff that's been bootlegged for many years, whether it even comes out? Because let's face it, those of us that want it that badly enough will find a way to get it. So, mm-hmm. you know, does it really matter whether, whether or not it's released commercially? Or does it really do some damage to the Beatles? Because by releasing all this other stuff, it can only increase interest in them. How do you guys feel about that? Hmm. I, I don't know if it does them damage not releasing it. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it would be uh, more interesting for everybody if they did release it. I mean, they would get ink. They would, you know, they, all these things would be covered. And, you know, yeah, look, we can get them on bootlegs, but we end up with a bootleg copy of the Shea program that looks nothing like what we know that film looks like. You know, Um, if they put it out, it's going to be in super shape. And, um, you know, I think that's what we want. And I think that I don't know. I think that. I don't think it can hurt them to put it out. I mean, I, I guess they may be thinking that if they put it out and it's not a big success, that hurts them. Um, and they may they may have to reorient their thinking because they've held this stuff so long that, you know, we're all getting a little bit, you know, we're all turning into Alta Cockers complaining about the Beatles not releasing <laughs> <old> stuff. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and we're all getting older and, um, you know, some of us aren't making it to when Let It Be comes out and, uh, and Shay. And so their optimal audience is actually shrinking. So, you know, you would think that they would put it out while the optimal audience is still there. Right. But is it the optimal audience? To be honest with you, I just came back uh, from the, the Fest for Beatles fans in Chicago mm-hmm. and saw an awful lot of, you know, young people who were there and very young people, you know, I mean, you know, babies, you know, just kids tweens, teens, Mm. 20s, and most of them, frankly, don't care about all that stuff. You know, they care about, you know, the music that they know, which is Mm. what they hear, which is, you know, largely is the music, is the, the music on one, on the red and blue albums, things like that. Right. Mm. You know, I think they, I think they know the, the full catalog of the group mm-hmm. much better. Yeah. From please, please me through let it be or Abbey right. road. I think, right. You know, it's not just the hits. Right. But beyond that, they really don't care about, mm. you know, about, you know, take two of don't bother me and whether it's in stereo and whether the bass <laughs> is in the left hand channel or the right hand channel, you know, they don't care about that stuff. And, and you got you got to have the hi hat intro on all my love. Yeah, That's right. Such a big difference. Well, we even we even <laughs> had it in name that tune yesterday. As a matter of fact. Oh, okay. Hmm. And somebody got it. I, I just think it's really kind of funny that the Beatles objected so much to um, the rock and roll music album and the um, the love songs album, and that they, when they finally settled with EMI in 1989, they put a clause in their contract saying, you can no longer do this kind of thing. We have to approve everything. And so what brilliant idea has Apple come up with? All the number one hits, which to me is not much different than all the all the songs about girls or all the rock and roll things. It's pretty much the same thing, except that it's been wildly successful. Okay, there's no we... there's no arguing that there's it's mm-hmm. been wildly successful. You know, we, we were saying just before the show that the idea for the the first whispers about the one album kind of appeared at the 2000 Beatle Fest in Chicago. And we were saying at that point, there's no reason to put this out. Why on earth are they doing this? Putting out the same songs over and over and look what happened. Yeah. And it It doesn't, and it doesn't happen with let it be naked. It doesn't happen with yellow submarine song track. song track. It doesn't happen Mm -hmm. with a lot of these other didn't, it didn't happen with the love soundtrack as a matter of fact. You know, mm. it's it's only this one simple 27 song collection, 
which has been a phenomenon. But you could say the Beatles anthology did really well. Well, all three were number one albums. And, yeah. And the, um, uh, the first BBC set was also a top five album. So, so they certainly were, were very successful too, but not on this scale. Right. So there, therein lies the question. Do you really have to release all this stuff? Or is it only appealing to the Althacacas who care about this? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I kind of think I, I kind of think that a lot of people, even if they're only casually interested in the Beatles, would be interested in seeing a film of them playing at Shea Stadium, you know, playing live all the, the whole everything they've heard about screaming girls and all that stuff. And, you know, I I think they would want to see for themselves what that experience was. And, um, you know, I, I don't see that it can lose, but. Yeah, and not only that, but in this day and age when you can watch almost anything on YouTube, yeah, exactly. is there that much of a need to put out a DVD? Right. I mean, yes, if it's cleaned up and it's the best picture quality you've ever seen, I'm all for it. But a lot of fans may not care that much. So mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, That's why I'm questioning you guys on this. Well, again, we're talking about something that was filmed in 35 millimeter. I don't see why the hang-up. I mean, we're not talking about... The grainy, uh, well, assuming, you know, I mean, Ron says the, the remastered Let It Be footage looks fantastic, but the grainy Let It Be footage looks, you know, looks grainy. And, you know, that's going to put off people. Um, but we don't have that problem, apparently, with the with the Shea Stadium. I mean, we all we all of us saw that what, what was in the anthology and they look great. So, you know, the question is, why not? You know, I, I it's it's hard to understand. It's I mean, not I could really it's not really hard to understand because if in one on one hand, if you want to take into account Ron Howard, film, the fact that maybe they're saving that for, you know, for the release of that album or the release of that film. And on the other hand, just the, the fact that all along they have resisted releasing this and Hollywood Bowl because it's the the performances are not up to the standards of the Beatles studio work. I don't see, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the problem with that because I mean, it's a live recording and it's history, but it's, it's not history. up. It's not up to their standards. You're talking about the Rolls Royce of pop music catalogs and to put something out where, where they've, you know, and it's well known that they had to go in and sweeten the sound on the uh, you know on the Shea Stadium soundtrack because they because they realized how bad how bad it sounded musically mm -hmm. you know it's just not it's just not up because because frankly Shea Stadium was not about the music Shea Stadium was about the Beatles Shea Stadium was about the occasion was about this 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 happening of fifty five thousand five hundred kids mostly mostly girls putting out this incredible energy and the beatles just kind of standing there on stage in wonder at this incredible happening so it wasn't really about the music it was about the the whole thing the whole gestalt if you will of of the of the event it was about the event more than more so than the music the music well, was I, is secondary and well, it doesn't matter it, whether it's in and it doesn't matter whether it's in stereo or mono it's it's you know it's it's secondary getting it's, getting back to the point that ken was making or, or that ken was talking about earlier with george harrison and the marketing if you ignore things like this for too long you do hurt the product how Absolutely. is it hurting the product when you when you've had when you have the biggest selling album of this century, a collection of twenty seven number one hits? How is not putting a a semi you know a uh, you know a less than passable musical performance out, you know uh, as a you know as a, as part of a documentary film? How is that hurting their image? 
Well, I don't think, uh, well, n uh, number one, I don't think, uh, I think we're disagreeing about the less than passable because I don't think that's true. But the other, but the other point is, uh, you know, any, and I'm, and I guess I'm, I'm starting to think like an advertising exec or a marketing executive. Anytime, you know, you, when you put things out, you keep your name before the public and the more you don't, even if we're talking about the Beatles, they do the the, the product the, the brand does suffer. But the and Beatles think... name is constantly before the public, either through you know through things like one or these anniversaries or Paul McCartney on tour. Or it keeps... or, du or dummies like me writing every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I know. mean, I know, and I, 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 your your point is well taken. But on the other, on the other hand, and I'm trying to get to it as quickly as I can here, the chart representation is is not there. I mean, uh, you know, it's not. They're not making waves in the chart at the moment. You would hope that, you know, the Beatles would be trending or you know something, and no, you know, that does that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if ten year old girls aren't. Twittering about the Beatles, it doesn't, you know. Instead of Justin Bieber, it doesn't. It that doesn't. It that doesn't matter at all. That has I, nothing to do with. It. Oh, no. I think that. I, I you're think talking Beatles... about. You're talking about a. You're, again, you're talking about the Rolls Royce of pop music brands, if you will, and it and you know it doesn't. It doesn't matter if they're not if they're not on trending on Twitter. Who cares? If, I if think they're I, trending I, on Twitter, the people that are trending that are trending on Twitter, uh, you know, two weeks from now are forgotten. It's oh, it's it's it, that's it's that stuff is nauseating to me. Oh, I, 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 it, it, may, it may it may be nauseating to you, but I bet you there are people inside the label, or there are people around that are looking at that and going, you know, how can we get the Beatles? rejuvenated uh, uh, that way. I mean, I, you know, I really think that's, I really think that's true. I, I mean, uh, Alan, uh, Ken, what do you think? Alan? Um, I think that, you know, the Beatles and Apple are a business concern um, apart from everything else that they might be. And they, Apple exists to oversee the Beatles marketing, uh, protect their rights, all of those things. And, and I think that having them before the public with new stuff is an important thing. I mean, not new, new, but you know, stuff that everybody hasn't already had a million times. I mean, I, I realized that the one album sold a lot of copies, but it having sold a lot of copies doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only thing that Apple should do or that people want. Say they're, they're coming, coming to take me away. Ha -ha. Ha -ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see how it can hurt them to have new news in the news instead of old news in the news. I mean, Shay, even Shay at this point is sort of old news. I mean, everybody yeah, knows exactly. about it, but I think having a spiffy new production, sort of like, look, when they put out the um, Maisley's Brothers material in a new format with extra stuff that people hadn't seen, I don't know how it sold, but I, that was kind of exciting, you know, and, it, and mm -hmm. it did get some press and it got some attention and it got talked about. And, you know, it may not be a, as good a seller as the one album, but I mean, no one's saying that they shouldn't do one and well i would say that they shouldn't but <laughs> let's say that nobody is saying they shouldn't do things like the one album for the more general fan i think that they're they're gearing everything to the general fan and virtually nothing to the people who were really really deeply interested in the music that they made because there are more people that are that are casual fans who only care about the, the core catalog and don't care about all of this ancillary stuff and take two of a uh, little child and stuff well, like that. That may be, that may be, but you know, if they put out the one album and it sells to 10 million people and they put out the Shea stadium thing and it sells to 400,000 people, that's still 400,000 sales. And it 
gets Shay, it gets the Beatles into the current discussion. I mean, you know, if that thing came out, Rolling Stone would do a big thing about it. All the newspapers probably would. There'd be there'd be mm-hmm. items on the TV news shows, like when the anthology came out. You know, and the TV news show, since the you know they're basically. Uh, the, the the people who run them are basically people who haven't heard anything that didn't have that happened before last Tuesday. Mm-hmm. You know, they would be presenting this as if, wow, this is some brand new find. The Beatles, right? Stadium. And then you they know. and then they would listen to it and see that and hear this inferior recording. It's not though. <laughs> it's you know this you know no, it's no. good. That doesn't sound like Ticket to Ride. Are we are we listening to the same recording? I mean, yeah, I think it, it, it does. You know, it does sound like Ticket. They're they're out of tune, and uh, you know that's not that's not what Ticket to Ride sounds like. I honestly don't think that that people are going to be turned away from a live performance of the Beatles at Shea because it doesn't sound exactly as the studio recording. They're going to know it's a live recording. I mean, the thing is, we keep expecting the Beatles, or in this case, there's only two left, to think like we do, and they don't. And they have a high standard. You know, I, how many of us have seen that photo that I've seen posted on uh, Facebook where there's a photo of the four Beatles from 69 and, and it reads, sorry for raising the bar too high. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, yeah. and that's the thing. Uh, you know, the Beatles had very high standards, the highest standards you can imagine. You know, they knew what was good music, what should be released. For the most part, I think their judgment was completely correct on just mm-hmm. about all their studio recordings. Mm-hmm. But I do believe, and this is just my opinion, I agree a lot with, with Alan here, that they care way too much about sales. They shouldn't care that much whether or not a new album or a new CD makes it to number one. And I think that people expect the Beatles to hit number one to the point where if they don't, then it's, then it's a bomb or it's a disappointment. So they shouldn't be thinking that way, you know. Doesn't Paul McCartney can care about sales? Sure, he does. Sure. And yeah, but he's always putting out new material all the time, and he's promoting it a lot. So, you know, I, I'm just, I just think there's way too much of an emphasis on on the sales, and there's so much interesting stuff that the Beatles have done that remain unreleased. The thing is, really? if they release stuff that only sells, like Alan said, four hundred thousand copies, that's not a disappointment to us. Maybe it would be to them. They shouldn't care as much about that. They would get so much publicity out of any new release. We are looking at a time right now where I personally think there's so much reverence for the Beatles. The slightest little comment that comes out of Paul or Ringo makes headlines. I mean, they don't really have to work that hard to get publicity. Exactly. They really don't because of who they are and the stature of who they are. That's a reverence that you can't can't, uh, say anybody else has in the world for the most part i mean it's a rare breed that gets that kind of publicity for almost anything that goes on in their lives wait a minute Uh, you're wrong you are wrong there because if you look on facebook if you look on you know there's so much celebrity bull that goes on every day you know that uh, you know, tracking every you know every breath that people take, every you know every time they pick their nose. The Beatles aren't above that. The Beatles are no no better than yes, that. They, so, yes, they are. The Ringo and Paul are the only two people alive who know the kind of fame that the Beatles had, that Elvis Presley had, that Frank Sinatra had, and that Bing Crosby had. They were the biggest entertainment stars of the 20th century. And they were, you know, they're, they are the, the, the phenomenons of pop music. And I Paul love- and Ringo are the only ones alive. And I'm sorry, Justin Bieber, Beyonce, Jay-Z, Eminem, whoever, whoever is trending on Twitter today doesn't have a tenth of the fame that those two men have had for 50 years. I'm not comparing them to Justin Bieber, to any, any of those guys. What I'm saying is that in the celebrity mill... Who I mean, cares about the celebrity mill? You'd the be surprised. Mill you'd be is very, so very, su- yeah, you'd be very surprised, Al. Can you can get this out, but the celebrity mill is bullshit. <laughs> Beep. Oh. <laughs> 
absolute <laughs> bullshit. You well, know, Paul and Ringo are not celebrities. They are entertainment phenomenons. Hmm. And they are the only ones still alive who are part of that of that summit. And I'm sorry, you know, Beyonce is not part is not a is not an entertainment icon. The Mick way Jagger? He, Mick, Mick even Mick isn't. Mick isn't, Pete Townsend isn't, Dylan isn't, nobody. They those two men are the only two people alive who know the kind of fame that the Beatles had. Mm. You know, whenever I go on the internet and I have my Yahoo page out, there's hardly a week that goes by when I don't see Paul's name or Ringo's name there for something. Exactly. And it's so, gonna... so 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 insignificant. Right. <laughs> it could Paul remembers writing Michelle and all of a sudden, boom. There's an article about it. Right. Paul's standing on a corner talking on a cell phone, and there's a picture. Right. You know, you know that's. But Paul, you know, Paul's not Paul's not above what's happening to a lot of other people. I mean, it's happening to. I, I see it all the time. It's happening to a lot of other people. I'm not not trying to. You know, for anybody that's listening, I'm not trying to, you know, lessen Paul's significance in the world of music, his accomplishments. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just saying that while we, I mean, we all hold the Beatles to a, uh, you know, above. We all worship the Beatles. There's no, there's no getting around that. We don't worship the Beatles. We we respect, we respect the Beatles for for the greatness that they have, for the greatness of their music, for the greatness of their personalities, for right. the fact it, that they were a, that they were, you know, Jimmy O'Neill said it in October of 64, the entertainment phenomenon of the century. Right. You know, well, for, we what, all, for, we what all, they, for what they were, you know. But we, and, we also need to be realistic. This is 2015, not 1964. And things are not the same. And, I, you know, much as I would love them to be, they're not as magic as they used to be. I'm not saying they're not great. I'm not saying their history isn't fantastic. They haven't, you know, I'm not saying anything like that. They, I'm sure they know that. They're, they've got a lot of competition going on now. And whether, the, you know, they know that. Believe me, they do know that. And it's not something that I, there's, I really... There's no, there's no competition as such. You know, they're not in, they're not, in competition with anybody depends on how you look at it no depends they're on... not they're not in competition with anybody uh, i think i think you I have wouldn't, to i wouldn't say a catalog from 50 years ago is competing with new artists of today how can you even look at it that way steve yeah i mean it's it's one thing if you're talking about a brand new release of unreleased beatles recordings or if the dvd comes out of the beatles at shea it's a new product that hasn't come out legally you know, and that will be in competition with other stuff that's out there. But, uh, you know, Paul and Ringo are not thinking about, you know, how Beatles recordings from 50 years ago, how well that's selling compared to the current artists of today. I don't think they think about that at all. No, absolutely well, not. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I would I would I would say they uh, I would think they probably have to because it's all part of the I mean, they, they have to know how they have to have an idea that something is going to sell before they'll put it out. They're not going to just throw it out there in the uh, in the ether and say, "Here, folks, take it." Well, Ringo puts happen. out new albums, and he knows that they're not going to be big sellers. Ringo's a different story, you know. Not, and Ringo and, is and, a different story. He's and, realistic. Go ahead. And and Paul, you know, Paul. I think tries. I think Paul aims higher, but he's not thinking. You know, uh, I mean, yes, he did kind of attach his, his star to, you know, the Kanye West and, Ray, and Rihanna, uh, you know, a few months back. But I, I don't think when he puts out a new album, he's aiming at, uh, at having a huge hit record. I think he's having, you know, aiming at having a respectable sales record, as, you know, as was the case with New. But he's not, you know. I don't think he's. I don't think he's delusional enough to think that he's that he's in competition with any of these, you know. Frankly, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, Twitter trenders or whatever the hell, mm. you know. I mean, it's 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 so it's it's so ludicrous. Yeah, I okay. think that Paul well, cares. I think Paul cares a lot about his record sales, but I think yeah. he's realistic. Yeah, absolutely. He knows that he's not going to sell as well as the biggest selling artists of today, and he shouldn't expect to. Right. 
as great a talent as he is. Yeah. It's just not it's just not realistic. Exactly. Oh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with that at all. I'm not gonna argue with that at all. So I have one more news item that I came across on my screen that I forgot uh, that I haven't published yet, actually, that I'm going to put up tonight. And Ken, you'll recognize this because we had talked about this back in the earlier days of the show. Joe Smith, who wrote Off the Record and did a bunch of interviews with with uh, George and Paul and John and uh, George Martin. And, and, Yoko. and, okay. and Yoko. Yeah, Yoko. Just getting is getting a star on the Walk of Fame on August 27th, and they announced that Bonnie Raitt and Jackson Brown are going to be speaking. So that just was announced okay. this morning, and um, I actually have been working on that today and hadn't thrown it up because of, I've been busy all day, and I haven't thrown it up yet, but I am going to put it up tonight. But anyway, so there, that's a, a interesting piece of news, and that book is fantastic, and you know, you can get it for like less than 50 cents my, you know, before the mailing on Amazon, and I recommend everybody just look for it on Amazon. It's called Off the Record. Let me give you the full title. It's called Off the Record: An Oral History of Popular Music, and it's an 89 book, but it's readily available, and it's well worth it. And I well, think the the tape archives are still available mm-hmm. online, right? On the Library of Congress, yeah, yes. they, they put the uh, they put a lot of the interviews, including the Beatle, uh, some of the Beatle interviews, on the Library of Congress site, and and they're available free. And I'm not sure uh, you can't download them, I don't think, but you can if you. you right. Know, mm-hmm. Our our listeners are are very resourceful. You know, they can do audio captures and mm-hmm. God knows what yeah. they can get they can get them. But um, yeah, so there there you go. Okay. I would highly, highly recommend that book because if you love really good interviews, I mean, there's a good cross-section there of, of entertainers and musicians of all different styles of music. And most of them are about two, three, four pages. So, right. um, looking, you know, they're very I'm, concise I'm, and very informative. So, Right. I'm looking at the cover here. The, some of the names on the cover are uh, Artie Shaw, Woody Herman, Ella Fitzgerald, Ray Charles, Barbara Streisand, Little Richard, Bob Dylan, Smokey Robinson, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, George Harrison, Yoko Ono, Elton John, Paul Simon, Rod Stewart, David Bowie, Phil Collins, Billy Joel, Jerry Lee Lewis, Joan Baez, Tony Bennett, Neil Diamond, Van Morrison, Jackson Brown, Robert Plant, and Tom Petty. And that's not even all of them. I mean, it's a superb book. And like I said, it's from 1989. It may be out of print, but it's fairly easy to get. And if you have a any kind of a music library, you owe it to yourself to get that book. Mm-hmm. All right, before we close, we just want to give a quick wrap-up of the two major events of uh, the past weekend of uh, August the 14th through the 16th. And, uh, Al, you were part of the Fest for Beatle fans. In Chicago. uh, Over in Chicago. How did that go? It actually was, uh, the the turnout was uh, surprisingly good. It was uh, probably the best in about three or four years. Uh, hmm. Friday night, in fact, was surprisingly strong. Saturday was very strong. Sunday was less so, but the, you know that generally happens. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was very, very good. I did get to see uh, Dick Biondi mm-hmm. uh, make his oh. appearance, uh, complete with the. Uh, uh, in fact, I mentioned it earlier uh, with the uh, uh, the clip of him playing "Please Please Me." In February of uh, of '63, mm-hmm. courtesy of Bruce Spicer, and uh, and he and uh, and Bob Eubanks uh, sat down with uh, with Terry Hammert on stage and uh, just uh, sort of uh, exchanged uh, exchanged stories for quite a while, and then uh, and then that moved into uh, a Beatles version of the Newlywed Game, which <laughs> uh, uh, from what I understand, because I was actually somewhere else doing panel discussions and such uh, went very well. And uh, there are you know, musical performances by uh, Billy Kinsley and uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, from the escorts and um, uh, Terry I mean, Sylvester. Right. Uh, they were probably the two main guests. Uh, also a performance on Sunday afternoon by the Weaklings. Mm-hmm. And um, plus the, 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 the normal concerts on Saturday and Sunday night. And plus, in in my in my end of things, we had a a busy schedule of panels and uh, audio uh, audio visual presentations, and uh, finally got to see the Fabratory, where uh, uh, which is kind of an experimental 
uh, section where people who don't normally get to kind of express themselves at the fest can do various and sundry things. And uh, it's uh, it's definitely, there are definitely uh, different things going on at the fest these days. Right. Did you witness any interesting interviews yourself personally? Um, well, the main one that I did see, as I said, was the conversation with Dick Biondi and, and Bob Eubanks and, and, and Terry Hemmer. Uh, they were uh, the the main ones in the ballroom. Unfortunately, I didn't see any of the others in the ballroom because I was, uh, as I said, uh, involved elsewhere with uh, with panels and and things like that. Hmm. Okay. And we had uh, we had some some interesting ones. Uh, uh, one with uh, Andrew Andrew Grant Jackson and myself on 1965. In fact, on Friday night. Um, we had a very interesting conversation with Bruce Beiser and Chuck Gunderson and Wally Pedrasic and myself about the the Beatle year of 65, which really kind of took in more of the the year itself. And then an interesting uh, panel on, uh, on Beatles podcasting, as a matter of fact, uh, with Richard Buskin and Robert Rodriguez from Something About the Beatles and uh, Anthony Robostelli, who does the uh, multi-track meltdown on uh, Beatles-Arama and, uh, and myself representing uh, this show. So, okay. and, you, yeah. and, you actually, and you didn't give away all our secrets. Uh, I tried, but un- unfortunately couldn't. Did you mention Life of the Lions? Didn't mention Life of the Lions either. So I, so neither neither of the uh, our secret weapons was uh, was used. You didn't have a panel on that album. Unfortunately, no, we didn't. Just did just didn't have room for it. Jeez. Next year, got, Al. Next year, next year, absolutely. That that'll be when we do a panel together, the four of us. It'll right. just be Life with the Lions. Just on Life with the Lions, right? Okay. All right, and for, as for me, uh, Danbury Fields Forever was so much fun. I can't believe how much I enjoyed it. And the main reason why is because I got to see all these different performers, uh, tribute bands, who are all different in their own way. I think that Charles Rose Day did an excellent job in presenting all these different bands that you, there's no similarities between one band from one band to another. You had bands there that did early Beatles. You had bands that played later Beatles. You had a psychedelic Beatles band. You had one uh, that I've always wanted to see that I heard about from Long Island called Penny Lane. And they wore the Sgt. Pepper suits. And they they played a lot of songs on Sgt. Pepper and a lot of psychedelic stuff. And they had a couple of bands that specialized in solo Beatle music, one called After Fab. I know, Steve, you interviewed Ad Bach from from that band. And and Mm -hmm. they're from Massachusetts. They are phenomenal. It's strictly solo Beatle music. And they got such a great... Uh, reaction they they the crowd there wanted an encore which they gave and uh the onos that's another band from massachusetts and steve i know you know uh rachel and wayne cabral who are both in that band they also Mm -hmm. had something called harry fest which is a one-day event in massachusetts which is actually going to happen october the 17th um and it's kind of like the same concept as as danbury fields with Beatles tribute bands specializing in Beatles and and George and it's a, a charity thing. They've raised money for cancer in recent years. And anyway, they're part of this band called the Onos and they're a quintet and they're phenomenal. Four of the five members, all except Rachel who plays the drums, they they all share lead vocals and they're all great singers. And they play so, some I don't even want to call it oddball because I I just love the fact that they're mixing the stuff that you wouldn't expect to hear. They actually closed their set with Well, Well, Well. Wow. <laughs> and they were amazing. Any band that closes their, their set with that song from the Plastic Ono Band is a band that I deeply respect. And uh, they always play Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, George's song from Living in the Material World, which they send out to me because they know how much I love that album. Sure. And, um, you know, they, they mix that with some Beatles and usually lesser, lesser known or songs that bands don't, don't play, like Blue Jay Way they did. They had the Blue Meanies there. They're a familiar band. They've been around for a long time in the uh, New York area. They've, they've been known for not only uh, being a Beatles tribute band, but also a lot of other 60s groups. They do Beach Boys. They do Kinks. And they were phenomenal. And they also play a lot of the songs that you don't expect most Beatles bands to do. And they really are very close in sound to what the Beatles did. 
I was really impressed with when they did Dr. Robert, especially. You don't expect bands to do a song like that. Mm -hmm. And they also, we had Hilton Valentine there as a special guest, the guitarist from The Animals, and he jammed with uh, the Blue Meanies for a couple of Animal songs, which was really cool. Um, And the Hoffners closed the show. They're a band that's been around in Connecticut for a long time. They recreated the entire 1965 Shea set list, and they sounded great. They sounded the best I've ever heard them. They're there almost every single year. And, um, you know, there's so many different acts there. They all did something different. And whether they're trying to come close in sound to the Beatles or do their own arrangements, I love all of it. I love that whole cross-section. And the thing is, if you're, if you're into Beatles tribute bands, you can either just look up all the different names of what's in your area and investigate them one by one and go to different clubs, or you can see them all at once or many of them at once at something like this. And I had an absolute blast sharing the stage with another MC, Gary Thoreau, who does a show called The History of Rock and Roll on Rewound Radio. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Charles was great. And Candy Lennon was there, you know, as a special mm-hmm. guest. She was there with the authors panel, along with Fred Velez, who's uh, written a book on the monkeys. We all know Fred from being a big Beatle fan and monkeys fan. Sure. Doing a lot at monkeys conventions in particular, and also helping out Charles with his Beatle conventions. So, um, you know, we had a fantastic time. It was 90 plus degrees weather. (laughs) And uh, I felt it on stage, believe me. I don't know how any band like Penny Lane could wear the Sgt. Pepper outfits in in that kind of heat. So kudos to them and to all the bands because they were really phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, it was a great time. It really was. The fact that it actually fell on the actual date of the 50th anniversary, it was timed perfectly, of the Beatles at Shea. It was really nice, and you couldn't have asked for better weather. So, you know, this has become uh, an annual thing with Charles, Danbury Fields Forever, and uh, hopefully we'll have another one next year. Cool. And thanks mm-hmm. to everyone who came up to me who uh, w- was familiar with my show in Connecticut of Every Little Thing, and also I had a few people who are familiar with our show. So I got some really great feedback from those people. So if you're listening right now, thanks to all of you for coming to the show and for talking to me about both my shows. So there you go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Oh, in fact, I should add that at the fest, uh, Liverpool on Saturday night uh, mm. also played the, uh, played the Shea Stadium set list. Oh, nice. On the, on the 50th anniversary. And there was also a, a, one of the new features is a section called, uh, called Apple Jam, where a lot of Beatle bands play in a, a section of the a, a section of the hotel kind of apart from the main you know the main stage mm. mm-hmm. and that's kind of like what goes on in new jersey yeah exactly you know, on the upper level there's always several bands who are jamming and also on the main level too right kind of close to where the bar area is yeah well this is these are actually specific uh, you know, specific bands as opposed to just, you know, the, the jam sessions. Yeah, that yeah. are much looser. Yeah, exactly. These are actually specific bands who had specific set times, hmm. including our friend, uh, our friend Scott Erickson. Oh, yeah. Who, yeah, he's uh, a great musician. Yeah, who did a, did a set on, uh, I think, on both Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So if anyone wants to get in touch with us, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page for things we said today. If you want to get in touch with us on Twitter, what do you have to do, Steve? It's a uh, at sign with things we said fab. So that's the way you can write to us on, on Twitter. And you can th- get in touch whether you're trending or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. All right. This has been a lot of fun. So, for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and myself, Ken Michaels, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.